They live by night. They hide in the dark and rise from the shadows. They can never feel the warmth of living human blood in their veins. Their bodies are cold and dead. I'm DC. And I'm Michael. And you're listening to the Monster Guys Podcast. Here is paralyzing suspense behind whose fiery hypnotic eyes lurk the demon forces of another world. They're not human. They ought to be destroyed. Electrifying terror. Electrifying terror. Electrifying terror. 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 Here is paralyzing suspense. Electrifying terror. Paralyzing suspense. Electrifying terror. 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 A moment ago. I stumbled upon a most amazing phenomenon. It's the, the, the Monster Guys, Mon- Mon- Monster Guys Pod- Pod- Podcast. We are gathered here as advisors, as scientists, as government experts. What we need is time to investigate. A strange, distorted creature, haunted and possessed by something beyond human understanding. There's a whole new world out there, a wilderness, uncharted. And he's been there. Come back, he's got the map. Warn everyone not to touch anything unusual they may find in the streets. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Monster Guys podcast. We've got a great show in store for you tonight, so let's get right to it. Michael, tonight... We're starting a brand new series titled Monsters Among Us. These episodes during the month of October of the Monster Guys podcast is going to be about real life monsters. We're starting that series tonight by talking about Elizabeth Bathory, possibly one of the most notorious, most prolific killers in the pages of history. Possibly. And that's that's the issue. And you're right. The issue is a lot about her is fact A lot about her is folklore. We're going to try to sift through a bunch of that, try to figure some of it out, but mostly just present what's there. Very interesting character, but she's definitely up there, probably in the top 10 of all time well-known serial killers. Just plain evil at times, so... So we're going to talk about Elizabeth Bathory here in just a few minutes, but we promised to give an update coming back into October because technically we took the month of September off. I don't know why, but I feel like I worked more in the month of September in the month that we took off than we do in the months that we're working. We we did a lot. We're talking probably, I don't know what, 30 to 40 stories that we wrote during that month, produced another three brand new shows that haven't even really started yet. We've written a couple of new books or are in the process of writing a couple of new full-length books. We've compiled stories that we have written previous to the past few months and prepared them for a whole new set of publication. I don't know. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. You got engaged. You had to go off and do something (laughs) wild and crazy like that in the midst of our month off. And I don't know, I feel like I've done more work in the past 30 days than I have probably in the last six months. And I'm about to pass out, to be honest with you. Yeah, starting to sit down and uh, record tonight, I think we're both, I think I, I'm glad to be back. It's it's fun. I'm looking forward to this series and tonight's episode, especially, but I'm tired. Yeah, I tell you, the energy that I have right now is because it's October. We are finally in October. It's finally full on Halloween season. Even though for me, that season began like August 1st, we are full on Halloween season right now. But we did promise before we took the month of September off that we'd come back in October and give an update on some new things that are happening with the Monster Guys. Just so you guys will understand what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and what's about to roll out. So I want to give that update now. First thing is, we've got a few new shows that are happening. As many of you know, we guest host with Folklore Thursday from time to time, FolkloreThursday.com on Twitter. That's an exciting part of our life. We love that community. We love hanging out with them. In the past 
couple of months, we've produced an article and a podcast for them. And we actually have another article coming out with them published, I believe, next week. I'll have to check the date on that, but it's a follow-up to that first article, uh, which was a lot of fun, and we got a lot of great response off of that. Still getting great response off of that, but we've added a new network that we're a part of, and we are now one of the hosts of Scream Radio, and that's scrmradio.com, and there's a link there on their site. You can click, says, listen live, and you can listen to 24-7, 365 streaming radio. It's everything a horror fan would want to have streaming. Let's talk a little bit about it, I guess. It is not your average radio, um, even for like an online radio, it is yeah. all about horror. So It is all about horror. We're talking creepypastas, story narrations. There are our hosts that are narrating the classics like Frankenstein, Picture of Dorian Gray, a lot of uh, Edgar Allan Poe writings that are being narrated. We've done a Poe and we've done Lovecraft, but there are a lot of storytellers, people doing interviews with filmmakers and authors on top of that. But we've been added as one of the hosts of that radio station every day, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time U.S. We now have a show called The Monster Guys Radio Hour on Scream Radio. That changes every week. Some weeks we have content that similar to what we do on the Monster Guys podcast, we pull in various topics, but in the midst of that, we also have another show that started that is a part of our Monster Guys network, and it's called Welcome to the Red Table. So this is one of the new shows that we have. Many of you have seen it pop up in our podcast feed over the last month because we've done a couple of episodes and we wanted to kind of put them out there as teasers for people to get an idea of what we're doing. But Welcome to the Red Table is basically where you and I sit down and we have chats with authors, filmmakers, artists within the horror community. And then we take a horror film, whether it's one from the classic archive or it's a brand new horror film, and we analyze it. We pick it apart, put it back together again, look at its history, look at its future, its impact on culture, yada, yada, yada. We sit down and we take apart horror culture from an analyst point of view, but really from a fan's point of view. It's definitely a different show for us, I think. This has always been a topic that we're passionate about and near and dear to our hearts, but we talk a lot about folklore, mythology, monsters, uh, history. So getting to this side of pop culture and horror, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think we'll branch out from movies a little bit as well here and there, but definitely looking forward to picking apart all aspects of horror culture. Yeah, so some of you have asked me, are you guys turning to horror completely? No, we're not. The Monster Guys podcast is still a lot about folklore, mythology, classic monsters, its impact on culture. Uh, that kind of thing. We'll continue to do that kind of thing through the Monster Guys podcast, which interestingly enough, we have a lot of horror fans that listen to our show. And in doing this new show, we're already finding that we have a lot of folklore fans that are listening to our horror show, who are also horror fans. There's a cross pollination of audiences there, if you will, which is kind of fun for us. So, and especially how we approach horror, we're approaching it from a standpoint of taking it apart, putting it back together, understanding it, the mythologies behind it, uh, what's influencing it, its impact on culture, the psychology of it. Our first two shows, we did Stephen King's It right after we saw it in theaters. Then the very next show, we did The Thing. And we went all the way back to the short story, John Carpenter's The 19 1951 version all the way to the 2000s. We talked about the thing from front to back in terms of story. So that's kind of what we're doing with Welcome to the Red Table. So it's fun, it's fast, it's horror, but at the same time, we still bring the level of the Monster Guys perspective to that content. The only problem being uh, is that we have covered it and we have covered the thing, so we're out of vague movie titles. Yes. So, so <laughs> now we have to get specific. <laughs> actually, our, our next show that's coming up, uh, you know, right now, I think is actually in production is one that is not just a vague movie yeah. title. It's it's actually comedy <laughs> horror. Well, there's there's only so many we can do. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we have the new show, Welcome to the Red Table. Another new show that we are producing right now actually stems from our previous writings in the dark fiction genre. 
we're going to be doing a new show called Carnival Street. Carnival Street is based off our short story by the same title from our World of Chaos books. Chaos Subsidiary, The Nightmare Has Begun, was the first book in that series, a three-part series. Carnival Street was the last story in that book. Carnival Street kind of represents a world between worlds. We have a series of stories that will come out as audio stories first based on the world of Carnival Street. It introduces a couple of new significant characters for us that will carry through some writing in the future for us. And it just kind of looks at things between the cracks, I would say, on the underbelly of this world which is already the underbelly of the world of chaos. So it's going to be pretty dark, uh, some of it gruesome, some of it cosmic, some of it disturbing, but just downright good old horror and dark fiction. Yeah, again, horror is very near and dear to our hearts, and uh, I think that's where a lot of our original writings, fiction writings, took place. You know, before our flagship series came out, before Charlie Sullivan came out, a lot of our short stories were horror, and they actually ended up in chaos. So that's always been a, a sort of home for us. So to bring that into a new series is terribly exciting, and uh, I can't wait to see where it takes off. Yeah, and Carnival Street, as far as the stories that we've written that'll be coming out over the next six months in this first season, is just the beginning. We, we have a bigger vision for this show, and we can't talk about that now because it will involve quite a bit of video production and storytelling that comes to life on the stage and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to start with these stories and we'll go from there. But we're very excited about it. Like you said, we've been writing dark fiction and horror for a very long time, but we didn't put it out for a long time. Now we just feel like we want to bring these stories to life. But at the same time, we're not just tipping the needle and going all horror. We're still very much invested in the Monster Guys podcast, our Yokai Tales podcast, and our Fairy Tales podcast. We're just adding to that portfolio with a whole nother realm of what we've been creating for a lot of years. And we're very excited about it. And we feel like a lot of you will join us in the other side of this creativity. Some of you may choose not to. Either way, we, we appreciate you being with us on whichever side you join us. Speaking of the... Fairy Tales podcast and the Yokai Tales podcast. Another update there. We're going to still continue to do those two podcasts. We have new Yokai stories coming out. The Fairy Tales podcast, though, we're renaming that because we feel like the stories that we have for that show are kind of expanded beyond the realm of just fairies and fairy tales. Even in the last season of those stories, we started to explore a little bit more with urban legends and, and contemporary fiction and things like that. So we're renaming that show from Fairy Tales Podcast to the Folk Tales Podcast. That is the working title, and I'm pretty sure that's where we're going to land on it. But I think that better encompasses everything that we're writing with those stories. It still includes fairy tales, uh, both classic and new modern stories, but it also allows us to explore characters and themes beyond what we find in classical fairy tales. Yeah, other cultures, other time periods, other monsters, if yeah. you will. So we're excited about that. We've got fresh stories coming out for both of those shows in addition to the Monster Guys podcast. There is another thing that we'll be uh, revealing probably closer to Christmas time that we've been working on for the better part of two years now. Actually went through a couple of focus groups with it. Uh, we did not release it publicly because we didn't like the platform. And so we pulled it back and decided to wait until we figured out the right way to present it publicly. I think we figured that out. And so right now we're just preparing some of the art, some of the writing that hadn't been completed, and we'll announce that closer to Christmas time. Uh, so we've got something new coming for you that's very exciting. Really exciting for us because we've been waiting for two years to bring this to market, so to speak, and put it in your hands. We also have our YouTube channel that's up and running uh, the last month and a half or so. We've worked kind of around the clock to get all of our shows up on YouTube. They're all there. So if you prefer that format or want to share in that format, we have all of our shows up on YouTube right now. We actually have the show in several other places. Like 
you know, your typical places, iTunes, Stitcher. You can also get our show on Google Play. You can get our show now through TuneIn dot com on the TuneIn app. I know a lot of people use that on Android, Apple, iPhone, iPad. You can find our show pretty much anywhere. Those are some big updates for us right now. We also have a lot of books coming out. I have a new title for young adult fans called Halloween Games that I think actually releases next week, Friday the 13th. You and I have a new collection of short stories coming out toward the end of the month. We're not going to share the title of that because right now it's just being teased out in the marketplace. And I'll just give you a hint. It's being teased with the number four. We'll reveal the title soon. For real. For real. (laughs) We have a new collection of yokai tales coming out in print form and a new collection of fairy tales that is coming out in book form, in print form. And we have two other full-length novels that are coming out in print form, but we can't announce those because it's a little bit of a surprise, and we do have some of our fans of those series that actually listen to this podcast. We don't want to make spoilers here and upset the fans for a surprise that's coming to them very soon. So there's been a lot going on this month, and that's not all. I mean, we're finalizing our list for our annual choices of honorary monster guys. A lot of people don't even know that we do this. For a few years in a row now, we've actually crowned, it's kind of a comedic way that we've done it, <laughs> but we've we've kind of crowned groups of people that are honorary monster guys, but we don't talk about it on the show because we've always done that live and in person with our live shows. This year, we're actually going to be doing this through the podcast, and we've got several names on the list, and we're finalizing that list, and closer to the end of the year, we'll be crowning a whole new realm of honorary monster guys. So we're pretty excited about that. And these are people that have had significant impact on us, with us, for us and uh, done some really cool things within the Monster Guys network to make an impact, a positive impact, either in their community or in our community online or during our live shows. A lot of cool stuff. We have been really busy. I feel like I haven't slept in about two and a half weeks. And after we record this podcast tonight, I'm going to sleep and I'm probably going to sleep for about 10 or 12 hours. And I'm going to go do some editing and then I'm going to sleep. And then you're going to edit and then you're going to sleep. Okay. (laughs) So the work continues. So the work continues with a lot of caffeine. We've got a lot of cool stuff coming your way. We do appreciate everything that you do for us, listening, downloading, reading our stories talking to us on Twitter, Facebook, and the different places online that we get to meet you. If we haven't answered all of your messages, emails, tweets, or private messages over the past month, we do apologize. We are catching up with those messages, but we truly have kind of been in a writing cave. It's been really dark in there, so we haven't been able to see, except for to carve out on stone our new stories. And out there, you all think that he's joking. (laughs) <laughs> um, maybe maybe we're not carving them out on stone, but we do have different writing caves that we visit sometimes. Yes, so. <laughs> absolutely. So it's uh, it's been a crazy month, and we've got a lot of good shows. So tonight, we've got Elizabeth Bathory, Monsters Among Us. Michael, let's get into that. Like I said earlier, she is probably one of the most notorious and prolific killers in the pages of history. But what we know about her is kind of a mixed bag. There's a lot of fact, historically, but then there's a lot of mythology. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't know for sure. So let's kind of shake that bag up tonight and see what we come up with. Tell me about Elizabeth Bathory. Give me some background on this intriguing and beguiled woman. Well, it's funny that you say pages of history. I'd like to point out as well that at least last I had checked, she was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as one of the most prolific killers at almost 650 plus victims. So now, this is 650 plus victims by her own hand, not like an army invaded and she killed 650 right. people during an invasion or her army did, but this is by her. Right now, we do have to take into account that she did have five servants that did help 
carry out these orders, but it was, it certainly wasn't an army. It was not an act of war. It was, it was within her close circle yeah. of influential people in her life. Now, that being said, that number is highly disputed, and we're going to get into that the yes. more we go. So I, I don't know. Where do we start with a figure like well, this? Do you want to start Let's with... talk about her family, because she was born into privilege. She was born into high birth. That kind of set the stage for the rest of her life. Some of the things that happened to her and her family early on as a child, in my opinion, set the stage for what she did and what she carried out later. Yeah, a lot of that family had a lot of issues. We'll just say it that way. But yeah. originally, they had taken the name of the Etched. And that's, I'm going to pronounce things as best as possible. We're talking about Transylvanian and Hungarian names. And that's all I'm going to say about that. They took the name Etched based on one of their estates that was given to them. I believe the anecdote goes as such where uh, one of her great ancestors, um, or great, great ancestors, I can't remember which one, how far back he went, but basically he killed a dragon. So that'll get you some fame and fortune. For that, they gave the dude a castle and they took their Did name. Did they ever produce the body of the dragon? It was in a swamp or something. No. He, he stabbed it three times with a spear. And it sunk to the bottom of the swamp. I Nobody guess. wanted you know, to it was actually a drag the net across that body of water. Detailed story about like how he killed it. He specifically stabbed it three times while it was taking in three huge breaths or something something ridiculous like and that. And this was one of her cousins. No, 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 no. Like old ancestors. So Oh, oh, an ancestor. Yeah, so... that's, that's why the family, from oh, okay. what I understand, that's why the family was actually well So we've known. got this tale that was told about her family Way from years past, and they just adopted the fame and the story and the name. Well, basically, they gave the guy a castle for slaying a dragon. And so the family from then on took that castle as a part of their name, that location, and through that, they also took on the name Bathory, or Bathory, which, if I remember correctly, means valiant or victorious. I cannot remember which. So who do I have to tell that I slayed a dragon in my days of past? Well, the problem nowadays is now to get a castle. you have, like, photo evidence, and you got to have it all over Facebook and Twitter, where... I've got Photoshop. <laughs> I can produce photographic evidence. That's the other issue, is everybody knows that now. <laughs> so, you know, her family came from this. Now, it should be mentioned that her uncle was actually the king of Poland at the time. Her yeah, brother... kind of influential. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Her brother was a Vavoid of Transylvania. Um, a Vavoid, for those who don't know, is a very high-ranking official. I think it's actually the highest-ranking official you can be. Yeah. And he was granted that position by the king of Transylvania at that time. So, you know, she was among high nobility. She was among kings. I mean, she had the credibility going on. Now... That being said, her family was known... Or the credentials, I should say. Yeah. Her family was known for having a lot of issues. Talk to me, Michael. Looking back in time... Family with issues. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back in time, a lot of historians believe that many of them were dealing with mental illness or physical illnesses due to inbreeding. Her father dealt with a lot of seizures, migraines, and what many people believe is epilepsy. And she displayed the same symptoms as a child, and they grew worse later on in her life as well near her, her death. So you have that going on. She herself was very intelligent. She was a little bit rebellious. You know, she wore boy clothing and she would go fencing and horseback riding, which was something that was generally not ladylike. God forbid. <laughs> she but, fenced and horseback riding? Oh my gosh. That being said, she was very intelligent. She was fluent reading and writing in four different languages. I, uh, I joke about that, but that's, I mean, that's, real life stuff, yeah. you know, considering the, the era of, of history we're talking about, you know, a lot of women or women were forbidden yeah. a lot of activity and, and even education and, and that kind of thing. And she rose above all of that. And we see that throughout her life. We see that rebellious streak all throughout her life. So it's something that is interesting to take note now. But she was very well educated. She was studious. She learned sciences. She learned logic, um, some of the classical education, math. And then, like I said, she was fluent, uh, able to read, write, and speak in four different languages at that time. So she was a very Which smart... That, that unto itself is pretty powerful yeah. for 
anybody during that era, during even in, in our modern era, that's that's powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, I once knew a general in the army that I worked under who was fluent in eight languages. I mean, it was just like being on holy ground, being around <laughs> that guy, because yeah. it, it really is. It, it's a it's a an awestruck moment to be in the presence of people like that. And here is a woman you know, centuries ago in a time when that was forbidden for most and especially women who not just one or two, but four on top of her classical education and then her attitude toward it all that I don't care what you think, I'm going to do it anyway. Now, that's the attitude that actually got her in trouble. Whereas the general that you were around, you know, that was a good thing to be around. Most people did not like being around her. She was very volatile, even as a child. People did not want to be in her presence because if you ever disagreed with her, if you ever spoke anything that she didn't like, she would let you know. And she would be pretty aggressive about it. So she so she didn't just speak her mind, but she pressed her mind against you if you disagreed. Or, or stood against her. In a very uh, wrathful way, yes. Yeah. And, and there may be different reasons for that. I cannot remember the exact dates or the exact circumstances, but uh, one source that I was reading from was talking about how, you know, she was a, a child of four. She was one of four children, and she actually witnessed the rape and murder of her two elder sisters, and then turned around and witnessed the execution of the culprit as he was, uh, I believe what they did was they heated up a throne and sat him on that throne own to be executed in that manner. So, Wow. And this is when she was somewhere around the age of 10. Yeah, somewhere Maybe, maybe a little bit that. younger, but what, what a powerful impact that would have on any child. So more along that timeline, though, around 11, actually at, at the age of 11, she was engaged to a young count who was 16 years old by the name of Count Ferrant Nadashti. He was actually of a lower nobility. He was still a count, but uh, he was marrying up by marrying her. So it was kind of a, an arranged political marriage. Somewhere between the engagement and the actual marriage, it was said that she actually had an illegitimate child. So this is at the age of like 13 or so. That was kind of rushed off and taken away so that it didn't cause political issues later on. So there's a lot of upheaval and strange stuff going on at this time. Now it's important to know that Nadashti's father actually died early on. And when Elizabeth went to live with him as they did on those days to learn how to run the household and be trained for marriage, basically. Her mother-in-law to be died before, you know, they were ever married. So there was a lot of strange happenings at that time, a lot of uh, people dying off left and right, it seemed. And, you know, they were married in this very uneasy time, I guess is how I would say it. Volatile, almost. Yeah. And it continued to be volatile. Right after the marriage, basically, he went off to battle. Most of his life, from then on would be spent on the battlefield with the Ottoman Turks. And he was very quickly known as, I think they called him the Black Knight of Transylvania or the Red Knight of Transylvania, something like that. Something the very Black epic. Black Knight? Yes. Michael? It was, it was very epic The Black Knight? Of this place oh. or that. <laughs> Dang it. So I wanted to pull out the flesh wound quotes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. He, he was known as having a very successful career. Yeah, he, he gained a lot of notoriety for his advancements and victories over the Ottoman Empire. But he was, because of that, rarely ever home. Which led into a lot of affairs, extramarital affairs on Elizabeth's part. At least one. Um, again, there. this is where a lot but of But there rumors... were rumored mm-hmm. more. There were rumored numerous affairs. Yeah, that's where a lot of that started. It's also interesting to note that when they did get married, people would refer to her informally as Lady Nadashti, but she kept her title, she kept her last name as Bathory because she was of a higher nobility. Right. So again, we see that pride there um, that she continued to keep through this trying time. So he he was away at you know at war. I don't think there was an official war going on at the time or battles. Or if there was, he was just not there. Um, she was now managing several different households, several different castles uh, that they owned together. So she was always in a different place politically. And what I I didn't realize until recently was that she would actually have to anytime he came home she would have to arrange you know the parties and stuff for his homecoming so Mm -hmm. she was all over the map as far as locations go again a lot of back and forth a lot of upheaval and unease 
so obviously during this time, she would start to get lonely. She would go and visit other places, visit with other people, including her aunt, Clara Bathory, who was known as a very volatile woman as well, got her into a lot of strange sexual practices. Clara was also known for being very violent. It's believed that she actually taught her several different ways to torture people. Later on, Clara was basically captured by a Turkish unit and violated and then murdered uh, in a pretty horrible way. So that also had a pretty devastating impact on Bathory before events went on as they did. Now, was her aunt's name Clara or Claire? Well, our westernized spelling is K-L-A-R-A. Okay. So a quick note on the names. We say Elizabeth Bathory. Her name was Erzabat Batory, as as yeah. best as I can say it. So yeah. there there are a lot of names that are kind of mixed up and watered down over time. So I kind of wanted to clarify that because some people may read certain sources and then other sources, and there may be conflicts of spelling or seeming pronunciation. But yeah. we're doing the best we can and kind of laying out the characters and the timeline here. Yeah. During these years, there are rumors of a couple of murders that have already taken place by her hand but none of this is confirmed. The years that really start to take off start in 1590. So 1590 was the years that, or the year that the murders really started to take off as as far as we know. Uh, She was 30 years old at the time. She was born in 1560 and her lifespan was not long. She died at the age of 54. So this is where things really started to take off. This was not long after the death of her husband who he did not die in battle. It's important to note. And the method of his death is kind of disputed whether it was a prostitute on a trip that killed him by disease or whether it was just a strange disease that took him. As far as I've seen, most historians seem to believe that he had an unknown disease that just kind of paralyzed his limbs and then he kind of wasted away within the years following. What happened after, basically a lot of people still owed him money, including the king of Transylvania. She started making very volatile demands going to the treasury, going to the king, demanding that they pay back the debts that her husband was owed but while he was still alive. And many people believe that this is when people started looking into her, looking into the the goings on within the castle, because not only were people starting to complain in the towns that You know, their daughters were going missing, people were being abducted, but you also have this political overtone of, well, she's now becoming a squeaky wheel, she's now becoming a threat. Well, and also you you have the rumors that are becoming prevalent about uh, occult practices, black magic, the term devil worship is tossed around uh, later on during the trial and everything, but there's the political, there's the spiritual dark spiritual overtones, and then there's the physical accusations or or implications of murder and torture and dismemberment and all the things that she had been accused of. Yes, and it's important to note at this time, the five people that were under her kind of directly helping her and during some of these these Yeah, these were the events. five servants. Um, you have Anna Darvolia, and then you have three older women who are mostly peasants for uh, her children's wet nurse as well was one of them. And then you have a disfigured boy named, it's, gonna, it's really hard to say, I'm going to try to say Fixco. We're just okay. going to go with that. But he was considered, uh, he was actually described as being a dwarf, and he would kind of go and abduct people. And and when I say people, mainly as the stories go, she would focus all of her wrath upon young women, uh, typically virgins. And the commoners, the common people. Yes. And here's what's interesting is a lot of people would send their daughters to her because she, after the death of her husband, actually opened up a school to teach young women how to be socially... Proper. Yes. I'm trying to think of the words there. Educate women, basically. And that's really when a lot of the stuff started going wrong because they weren't coming back. Mm-hmm. Now, what actually went on is where the disputes come from. Uh, some people say that Anna, the head, if you will, of that group of servants, yeah, they say that she kind of took Elizabeth under her wing and started teaching her the dark art, became widely popularized after, like 200 years after Elizabeth's death, that she bathed in the blood of virgins to get rid of the wrinkles on her skin. That's where right. a lot of people know her from today in pop culture. Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's the popularized version of Elizabeth Bathory is this queen that reigned in blood and bathed in blood and, you know, was basically Lady Dracula. 
actually, I was going to say that real quick. Lady Dracula is one name that's pretty popular for her. The other name is the Blood Countess. And it's believed by many that this was an embellishment. There was no real historical evidence except for an anecdote that um, she actually bathed in blood. There was one torture device that was said to have happened where um, it was basically a swinging cage with barbed hooks on the inside, and a girl would be placed inside, and then the boy, Fizco, the, the dwarf, would push the cage, and it would swing back and forth, and being that there are barbed hooks inside, you can't really avoid those, and eventually you just get slashed a bit. So, pretty gruesome, and along with that story was the belief that she stood under the cage and just let the blood drain down on her. So, Well, and let's go back to the whole bathing and blood thing for a moment, because, uh, and even according to some commentators, it was probably impossible to bathe in blood like pop culture has visualized it to have happened. Yeah, that's a lot of blood. That That's, I think, one person pointed out that's around 30 people, tw- between 20 and 30 people that it would take to get a full bathtub going. And then to do that on a regular basis, or at least on a basis regular enough to keep your skin young. Yeah. I mean, first of all, let's talk about the science of that, shall we? But then, <laughs> you know, just to have that many people drained of blood on a regular enough basis for that to be worthwhile, that's pretty far reaching. Yeah. And then you made a comment, I think, when we were discussing this, that maybe she was just you know, had the blood poured on her. But even that would be a a bit of a stretch to have uh, that amount of blood on hand to even be washed or scrubbed, if you would, in that kind of blood. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of the, a lot of people still look to that figure of 650 victims. And we'll we'll get to where that number comes from in the, the trials that took place later on. Now, I will say what she was historically thought to do, um, you know, there were many atrocities. Mostly, she was said to stick needles under people's fingernails. There was one girl that was said to have stolen money, so she superheated some coins and pressed those coins into the girl's hands to teach her a lesson. One famous punishment for a woman who was said to have talked too much was that she had her jaw sewn shut. I think another famous one was uh, there was a girl that was tied to a tree naked and then smeared in honey, and then ants were placed all over her. A lot so there of, was a lot of torture Yeah, that a, a is lot. documented. There are murders. There are disappearances. It's the number of it that's disputed mostly. Yes. We'll get to that real quick. Um, Heck, just doing one person <laughs> in honey and ants is enough to, in my opinion, tip the scale. I mean, much less, you know, the torture of several and the murder of more than that. I mean, we, we're still talking about a... A, a, a sadistic. Pers- uh, yeah, a person who's involved in just some of the most heinous crimes against humanity, against the person. I don't care if it's one or 20 or 600. It's still sick. It's very sick. And um, she was also thought to be a cannibal by some based on, I I believe, one story. Let's just, why don't we add cannibalism to the list? (laughs) Okay. Um, Even if she didn't bathe in blood, uh, there was one famous story basically of where she was bedridden so she couldn't carry out the torture herself. So somebody got too close to her bed and she reached out, pulled a person in and bit their cheek off. Pretty graphic. So she was also suspected to be a cannibal. And I think that's where a lot of that vampirism comes in later on after her death in popular culture and the, the craze of vampires that was sweeping Europe at that time. So you have all of these things going on. And during her husband's life, a lot of it, if murders were happening... A lot of it was being kind of overlooked. After he died, a lot of that protection went away. And it's interesting to note that when he died, in his will, he requested that a man named Thurzo would look after her and kind of take responsibility for her. Thurzo was a retired priest, um, an ex-priest, if you will, later became somewhat of a political figure. And during this time, he started getting complaints, uh, especially after, you know, Elizabeth started to go and demand money from the king, stuff like that. And let's not forget, she actually denounced the king at times. She would actually say that she supported her cousins against the king. So she wasn't very popular with him to begin with. 
So the king actually put Thurzo in charge of investigating Elizabeth, or just going to keep an eye on her. And what we see in his letters later on is that as he and his men went to her castle at the time, her favorite castle out of the the many that she frequented, according to the letters, there were bodies strewn about of young women. He went underneath to where the tunnels were and found uh, boxes of basically unmarked coffins with uh, mutilated female corpses inside. And I believe there was also one girl that was still in the process of dying. So he kind of hightailed it out of there, gave his report, and then went back to investigate a little bit more, talk to people around town. And later on, we see that a trial takes place. What's interesting about this, there are actually several things that are interesting about this, but uh, Elizabeth is never brought into that trial. And she's never really, you know, she is the subject of that trial, but her punishment is never decided in that trial. She's kind of disconnected from it in a weird way. By his recommendation, she's not given the death penalty or anything, but she is to be holed up in a tower, basically. And that's ultimately what happens. So the man that the husband put in charge of caring for her after his death is the one that was charged by the king to go look into matters, which then turns into a full-blown investigation, which then turns into a trial in which Elizabeth never even shows up for. She's never even called to the stand, so to speak, and is not really the spotlight of the trial, though her name is kind of swirling at the center. And upon this man's recommendation, Elizabeth Bathory is holed up in a tower to live out her days in that solitude. Yeah, basically. But it's her servants that actually get the sentencing. It is. That is so cruel and bizarre. It is. And I I can't really feel bad for them, considering, but what happened to them probably shouldn't have happened either. What's interesting about this is... So what are you saying, Michael? Do you or don't you feel bad for these people? Well... You'll see what I mean when I get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's This is a, a weird topic because going this far back in history, we start to get a lot of folklore and we start yeah. to muddle history with things of... With a, rumors and stories and... Yeah, of a supernatural nature. So Who wrote down what see, the and thi- for what reason? The thing is, he could only name, I think, about 35 victims. The number 650 was brought up as hearsay from a former servant who was said to have seen the figure or the number in one of Elizabeth's private journals. So it's a very... Okay, but but you say he could only bring up 30-some-odd victims, but he couldn't say that they were victims of Elizabeth Bathory, but rather of people around her and possibly she was involved yeah from his perspective there there were no eyewitnesses to elizabeth bathory murdering and torturing these people right there were 33 witnesses brought up and um, aside from the five servants and of them all of them basically were saying that they had heard rumors that was it the was all that hearsay was there was i think one person one witness who said i saw something happen yeah but it was eh, kind of sketchy. Basically, he saw that the he saw some young women that were still alive and that had been brutalized. Um, their hands had been burned. So he did see the effects of what was going on, but he didn't see who had done it. It wasn't in the act or anything. Right. So yeah, the trial was very finicky by today's standards, for sure. By any standards, I mean it sounds ultimately like a witch hunt. Well. Getting to that part, especially the five servants, um, I believe they had already confessed or they confessed later on. But either way, because of some of the accusations of being associated with the dark arts, it was a witch hunt. They actually tortured the five servants in order to get the answers out of them. They were on a witch hunt looking for one, but found five others in the process. Right. The dwarf... By um, whatever means they found them, they found them. Yeah. The disfigured boy, they basically beheaded him and then threw his body into the fire. The four women, they actually dipped their fingers in what they called Christian blood and then cut those fingers off and then burned them. So it was a very uh, bizarre and uh, nasty way to go, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, the trial itself was... By today's standards, it would be a farce. I think back then, it's still shaky, but it was enough for them to go by. Uh, The question a lot of people have is, did Thurzo do this for political gain? Did he do it because he believed Bathory needed to be put in check? Something to keep in mind was that the common people were not really seen as people 
due to a revolt that actually happened before Elizabeth Bathory was even born, there was a law written that they were actually slaves. That the common people were slaves. This was law. And the way that was actually translated or the way it was carried out was that one day a week or, you know, that may have changed based on region. But basically, they would work for free one day a week for the lords and the ladies of the land. So you actually have some clarity as far as Bathory's you know, actions. She didn't really see them as people to begin with. But on the flip side, you start killing off that many people and the king and people like Thurzo are going to see you not as just murdering people, but as messing with their own resources. Well, yeah, the, the, the common people were considered the property of the king. They were considered the property of the high officials. So if anybody, Elizabeth or anybody, starts picking off those people, you're essentially destroying their legal property. So you have a very twisted case any way you cut it, on any side of the the case that you cut it as well. So a lot of people question, you know, was he just trying to do the right thing? Or was he trying to act on the behalf of the king in a very political manner? One person that I heard talking about this actually brought up the fact that you know, as uh, Count Nadashti had entrusted Bathory to Thurzo, Thurzo may actually have had some gain himself in political lands, um, in in ownership of certain lands with her out of the way. Well, yeah, and I was going to say, not just that, but it wouldn't be too much of a stretch that this guy took over whatever inheritance or whatever was left to her became his. So yeah. apart from political gain, there was certainly a lot of personal wealth to be added to his bottom line. So there's a lot that is called into the question looking back throughout history. There is a lot of evidence, there are a lot of anecdotes that we have to go on. But as far as what was true and what was false, that's hard to untangle. And I don't know if you mentioned it, I can't remember in the midst of talking about it, but that number of 600 plus victims by her hand was actually just a notation in in a journal that was said to have been found by a servant. So it wasn't even a document that was brought into the courtroom, nor was it verified or we have any historical evidence of it. It was just, hey, I read in one of her journals that she killed 600 people. But hey, it's good enough for a Guinness Book of World Records. It's good enough for Guinness Book of World Records, and it's good enough to burn a whole bunch of people at the stake and hold somebody up in a tower. I guess one of the actual things that kind of piqued people off was that she was asking for burials more so than there should have been. So there may be more to the claim that there were more than 35, 37 victims. But again, 650 is quite a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot to hide in any situation. So ultimately, she didn't really escape a bad fate. She she still had a bad fate. She escaped death at the trial. But she was holed up in this tower in one of her castles. If I'm not mistaken, it, there was a hole big enough to feed her through, and that's how she lived out the rest of her days. Well, yeah, what I was going to say is basically because of her blood ties with you know, very powerful people, she she had gone on, um, you know, letters to try to get herself out of punishment. And based on Thurzo's recommendation, they bricked her up in a tower. And, um, and not just for a few weeks, this was for years. Yeah, I believe it was around five years. But basically what happened was, uh, you know, one day, night she was talking to the guard there and she was like hey i want you to you know feel my hands they feel cold i i'm worried about my circulation something wrong and he ignored her and the next morning they found her dead at the age of 54 so you know for somebody in popular culture that talks about her trying to get rid of her wrinkles through blood you know she died actually pretty young pretty young and holed up in a wall and to this date, we don't know where she's buried. Oh, yeah. yeah which that's a good lends point. to her legend in the realm of vampires, vampires and yeah. Dracula, <laughs> Lady Dracula. So she, we don't know where she's buried. Well, she was said to be buried at a church nearby, but they went to go dig up that grave at some point and couldn't find her there. Then they went and looked up the uh, the graveyard of the, the Etched family, you know, the Bathory's basically. Right, there, yeah. 
And Their adopted family name. They could not find her remains in that burial site either. So nobody knows. It's kind of like Vlad Depeche. Nobody really knows where exactly sh- the body is. At this and point. the legend goes that because he is an undead, he still walks the earth or yeah. did at that point. Yeah. So I haven't really heard any. Uh, but you know, there are some stories of hauntings, obviously, of the, the castle grounds and stuff. Of the few castles that she had, I think her favorite one was already in ruins. I can't remember. But the the grounds itself was said to be haunted for for quite some time and probably still is. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's such an interesting case, though, for this series, especially when we're going to go back and forth in time periods and we might talk about some more modern monsters among us. This is one of those stories that kind of bridges the gaps of topics that we talk about and will be talking about that, yeah. that intersection between history and folklore. Another, I think, fascinating piece of this story that lends again to the Bram Stoker Dracula legend and and the vampire legends apart from him, it, it's said by, by many that he was partially inspired by her story for the writing of Dracula. But going back, it was said, it was rumored that Vlad Depeche was seen with her. Yeah. Which was interesting because how far apart in time they lived, but again, it was this legend of this undead man that is being seen with this blood countess. Yeah, it could have been just an affair that was going on with some random person in a town, but you know, they lived hundreds of years apart. And yet there was this belief that the figure that was seen with her walking through one night was Vlad Depeche based on his appearance, which is pretty spooky. Yeah. And if it has anything to do with the black arts, you know, maybe, you know, they were accused of devil worship in the trial. And then you have the stories going back through history of learning the black arts that could be two different things or that could be the same thing. But well, it's yeah, and it's, it's a matter of, of language and, and what they were going to use to leverage against yeah. Uh, you know, to get whatever they wanted out of that trial, which obviously they did with the five servants. And then whoever needed Elizabeth Bathory out of the way got her out of the way as well. But that being said, it's, uh, I don't know, it's really weird. I, during the research for this topic, I came across an article titled, uh, I think it was like Badass of the Week. Elizabeth Bathory. And it kind of took me back uh, a bit because, and I, I found this in other places as well, that she's kind of a celebrated figure. Now, keep in mind, she did on behalf of some of the women at the time during the, the battles, when their husbands would die from war, so similar circumstances would happen. I think due to what she had seen her aunt die from due to things like her husband, she would actually intervene and try to help them out writing letters on their behalf, trying to help them out financially. But behind that nice side, number one, she wasn't a very nice person to begin with. Number two, she was a pretty sadistic evil person. So I'm not really sure I'd call her a badass. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I, she, I just think I'd call her a bad (laughs) <laughs> a, a monster, bad person a monster amongst. yeah definitely definitely a streak of evil in her you know it just goes back to remind me that monsters are among us and quite often those monsters are human it's a powerful thing to consider and in, in the world that we live in it's a constant fear among a lot of people that you never know what the person next to you is going to do or become or is This is a line that streaks throughout history of very ugly people, people who are indeed human monsters. Uh, It's not new to our age. As many people seem to believe, yeah. As a lot of people seem to believe. But uh, like I said earlier, whether Elizabeth Bathory is responsible for 600 plus murders or one, in my opinion, it's still a monster. We do have documentation and, and understanding that she was involved in several, at least, torturous heinous crimes against the person. I don't know, maybe she reached those high marks. Maybe she didn't. But regardless, she is certainly a monster that has lived among us in the human race. Deep, dark, shadowy, (laughs) unsettling, which is fitting. And I don't know, this is a fun series, but at the same time, it's, it's such a morbid curiosity series. It is. So if you are listening and you have some insight to Elizabeth Bathory, the history, the numbers, the folklore, the legends, whatever, we'd love to hear from you and, uh, keep the conversation going. Contact us on Twitter at the monster guys or on Facebook, Instagram, uh, at the monster guys, or talk to us 
us through our website, themonsterguys.com. We'd love to hear your insights and your thoughts, uh, especially during this Halloween season when all the spooky comes out to play. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. We'll be back next week with another monster that has lived among us. But until then, have a great week, and I hope you have your costumes ready. Halloween is just a couple of weeks away. We want to see those pictures, so send us some pictures of your costumes. We already have a few rolling in, so thanks for sending those to us, and uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you again here next week. Good night. Good night.